So without further ado, uh, I'll kick it off with Shannon and I will end the poll and release the results. All right, well, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, okay, so I believe the typical person when they go out to their mailbox and get their mail for the day, they have no clue everything that went into producing that mail piece. And I know me personally, when I first started at Production Solutions, I had been in print production, but my eyes were opened um, to how involved uh, direct mail campaigns can be. Uh, there's, and any production manager is an incredible juggler of, of uh, tasks and activities, so hats off to them. So we're gonna go through the life cycle of a, a direct mail production um, campaign. And uh, we're gonna kind of look at the different stages of production and give you some highlights and goals of each of those stages. I'm not gonna read these off right here, they're on the slide, but we'll dive in with the first stage of pre-production. <clears throat> so, Pre-production, just like it's the name, uh, it's, it's all the activity that's happening prior to actual production. And production means uh, presses running, uh, actual work happening. This is all the planning that goes into a direct mail campaign. And like anything, good planning makes for a much easier uh, execution of a project up front. So the goals of the pre-production stage are to make a game plan for your mailing. Understand uh, who the suppliers are gonna be, what, what methods you're gonna use to produce things, um, tie in your schedules, understand your costs, um, are some major goals in the pre-production, as well as one of the most important things is this is an opportunity to really vet the mailing um, and the materials to make sure we can uncover early in the process anything that can be problematic. Um, and there are a lot of things in direct mail that can be pitfalls. So it's important that production managers work through checklists to make sure we're thinking about all the different various things that can create problems later on. And we try to do that before we get too far in the process so that things can be uh, figured out early. Uh, so the life cycle, go back, Alex. <laughs> the yeah. life cycle begins when the... Um, the uh, client will release to us the campaign details. And this includes uh, things like we need to know the mail date or when they want this uh, project to be in people's mailboxes. From that, we can build a schedule backwards. We need to know the specifications. What is the mail piece going to be? What size envelope? What size are the inserts that are going to be in, for each of them? What kind of paper? Uh, what colors are going to print on each item? We need to know um, the, if there's a mail plan and segmentation happening. We need to know how, very rarely, does a mailing have just one package going to, the same package going to everybody on the data file. More often than not, there's gonna be segmentation happening. Certain donors are gonna get a certain version of a letter, or certain donors might get first class mail versus nonprofit mail. So we need to understand what all is gonna go into that segmentation, as well as maybe there's some testing going on. We need to know that as well. Uh, so the production manager is gonna get those, the, all those details, and then they're gonna work through a series of steps to determine the best production methods. We're gonna create a mock-up, we're gonna create a schedule and a budget, and then finally, it kind of all gets wrapped up prior to production with what we call an ATP, which is an authorization to proceed, which is a document that pretty much outlines all the, the specifications um, of the program as well as the costs involved uh, before we get into actual production. All right, next slide. All right, so as far as for planning production methods, there's a lot of different ways to print things um, and it's important that you're choosing the, the best methods um, to control your costs, to make sure you're getting the quality you expect, uh, so 
one of the first steps that a production manager will go through is to evaluate uh, the components and the specifications to determine what is the best way to print the letters, what is the best way to print inserts. There are two primary ways to do this. Uh, we can do sheet fed printing or web printing. Uh, sheet fed printing, just as the name implies, it's, it's a press that's feeding a sheet of paper through the press. Web press presses are much larger presses and you're feeding a roll of paper through the press. Sheet fed presses are easy to set up. So what they call make ready time in the printing world isn't very uh, long. There's not much setup involved on a sheet fed press. A web press, on the other hand, takes a lot of time getting set up, uh, so there's a lot of cost. And then also, on a sheet-fed press, when they're setting color, they can run a few sheets through the press, stop the press, evaluate the color, run a, run a, make some adjustments, run a few more sheets through the press. So you're not burning a lot of paper. A web press, you don't turn on and off a web press. So as they're setting color, you are burning paper. So there's kind of a, a, a trade-off uh, between sheet-fed printing setup and web printing in the setup time being less on a sheet-fed press, more on a web press, but the throughput on a web press is much faster than a sheet-fed press. So sheet-fed printing tends to be more economical for really uh, small quantities, small to medium quantities. I would say less than 20,000. You should probably be doing sheet-fed. Um, more than that, you're probably going to want to look at web press printing. But there are also situations where you might choose sheet fed over web. Uh, you're very, you're limited in paper that is available for web presses. So if you have some sort of specialty paper, you may be forced to print it sheet fed. Or um, quality, if you have a real high end piece, sheet fed printing usually offers superior quality. So in that case, you might want to consider sheet fed press printing. So this is one of the first things your account, man account manager, production manager will evaluate is whether we should do sheet fed or web printing. Next slide. Same thing with envelopes. Uh, there are different print methods for envelopes. And this is why um, having the preliminary art uh, is really helpful uh, at this stage, because depending on the art uh, may determine what is going to be the best method to print envelopes. So the, the three primary uh, methods are jet printing, flexographic printing, and flat sheet litho. So jet printing is you're printing an already converted envelope. Uh, the presses are very easy to set up, but you're, you're limited to standard size envelopes that printers can order and hold an inventory. It, it has good quality, but there are some limitations to these presses. Um, they're not good for if you have large solid areas of color or you typically cannot bleed, have image go off the edge of the envelope on a uh, jet printed envelope. Now flexographic printing is very economical for um, this says 100,000 plus quantities, but I think it's actually, you know, closer to the 50,000 range uh, is, is economical for flexo printing. And I like to think of flexo printing as a rubber stamp, uh, taking a rubber stamp and um, pressing it onto the paper. It's not the highest quality, but if your art is simple enough, it's often, you know, acceptable level quality, but it's definitely the most economical. Uh, if you have simple art uh, to get envelopes done. And then finally, there's flat sheet litho. And this is done on a regular sheet fed press, like our flat work. Um, the they're printed flat, and then the envelopes are die cut and converted and folded into the envelope form after they're printed. You, this is gonna be used for sophisticated art. Uh, if you have bleeds and photographic images, uh, you need close, tight registration on um, all the different colors that are printing. It's the most expensive, um, and it's also the most time consuming. So this is a, a primary decision that needs to be made early on in the process by the production manager. Next slide. All right. So then we get into mail shop personalization. Uh, again, just like printing for our, our, our components, we need to understand how we're, they're going to personalize at the mail shop. So 
similar to printing, there's cut sheet, which is um, just feeding uh, trimmed down sheets of paper through a laser machine, or there's continuous form lasering, similar to the web press, it's, it's feeding a roll of paper through the laser machines. And the throughput is much faster on those machines. They're not as high quality as the cut sheet machines. They're, um, there's a little bit more setup involved with them. So again, depending on your quantity, um, I would say less than 20,000, you probably wanna look at doing something cut sheet. If you're more than that, you probably wanna look at doing it continuous form. And then also, not all continuous form lasers can duplex, a lot can. Um, but you need to make sure you're, if you need duplex lasering, which is personalization on both sides of the piece, you need to make sure you're working with mail shops that offer that kind of um, service. Alrighty. And then finally, um, something that's really uh, taking off the last few years is digital printing. It's been around for a while, but it's really starting to take hold and a lot of people are investing in digital printing equipment. And this is kind of uh, printing and personalizing at the same time. Uh, so again, there's continuous and cut sheet options for digital printing. The, it's expensive. The consumables in digital printing are expensive. Um, the machines run slowly, but there's not a lot of setup time involved with these machines. So if you have low quantities, digital printing may be even cheaper than sheet fed printing, even if it's a generic component. Um, but for digital printing, you can do, you can have fully variable content. So here's an example from Heifer International, who had, uh, based on the donor's giving history, they got a different postcard. So, you know, if they gave a goat, they got the goat postcard. If they gave a chicken, they got the chicks postcard. And these were all run uh, at, intermingled in the same run. So every one that came off the press was different. Uh, so digital printing is really good for the one-to-one -one marketing and getting a very personalized message to your donor. And it can be full color. So those are some of the methods that the production manager has to evaluate in the pre-production phase, phase. Next up, we have to make a mock-up. So, uh, and this is especially important if a production manager is working on a new package. A lot of times we have clients that are running the same package month to month. We don't have to do this every month because we have a sample of what the piece is going to look like. But if they're designing a new package, it's really important to have kind of a physical representation of what that package is going to be. With the actual envelope cut to size on the paper, windows uh, placed where they're going to be. And everything that's in the envelope is, is cut down and folded and on the paper that's going to actually be used. And this mock-up helps us identify uh, potential problems. Uh, things like, is there going to be any machine inserting issues? Sometimes uh, mail shops can't uh, insert a piece if there's an open end on a, the bottom of a, a, an insert. So they might have to have special equipment for their machines to handle something like that. Or maybe your reply form doesn't fit into your reply envelope. This mock-up is going to help you identify that because it's not always easy to see when you're just looking at a PDF file on a computer screen. Um, also, we use these mock-ups to get weights and thicknesses on the package, which will matter for our postal rates. Uh, first class mail, if you're, if you're paying full rate first class mail, if you go over an ounce, you go from 55 cents to 70 cents. So if you have a piece that's 1.01 ounces, you're gonna, your postage all of a sudden is gonna go way up. So it's important to understand your weights and thicknesses so that you can control your budget. And then also uh, the production manager is going to be looking at the package and how, uh, and, and against USPS regulations to make sure everything is conforms to how the USPS requires things to be to mail, um, like bar barcode clear zones, um, the aspect ratios. There's a whole list of things that uh, we have to worry about with the USPS. So your production manager has a checklist of those items to go through to vet a package for any potential problems. 
And then finally, you can use these mockups to make sure that the package is going to work. Um, for instance, if you have a window envelope, is the letter going to fit in the envelope correctly so that what you want is showing out correctly or there's not some, something in the window that shouldn't be there. So the mockup is important and serves many purposes for finding problems in, uh, early on in the process. All right. So once the production manager has identified uh, the methods that are best um, for production, uh, we've got our mockup. It's time to get busy gathering costs for how much this mailing is going to cost. Uh, so we're going to competitively bid out each component, each print component, and also the mail shop work to our supplier network. And we're going to find the people who have the equipment that can do the production methods we need uh, for the various components. So the production manager is going to competitively bid everything out. And, but we need to think about all the things that a lot of people don't think about. There's a lot of things that can add costs to jobs. So we need to think about those things up front. For example, uh, here's a list, spoilage. Uh, when we are printing something, uh, materials to send to a mail shop, we always need to deliver more than they actually need because the mail shop is going to have waste in their process. It's not a perfect process. They're always going to have some spoilage. So um, production manager needs to make sure we're delivering ample materials for the mail shop to do what they need to get done. You never want to be short. Um, to be short and to have to go back to press is going to be a very expensive problem. So if anything, you want to have a little too many in the end. Uh, we have to think about what kind of proofs are going to be needed. Hard copy, if hard copy proofs are going to be needed, it's going to add cost to the job. So we need to think about that up front. Version changes. Every time uh, there is a print version, they have to stop the press. They have to change a plate. They have to bring the press back up. Every time you do that, it's going to add some cost to the job. Likewise, in the mail shop, if you have multiple versions of a letter that is lasering, there's time involved with the programming and the setup of that version of the letter. So versions need to be factored into costing out a job. You have to think about freight. You have to get the materials from a printer uh, to the mail shop. So you have to make sure you've got those costs. As well as any special requirements for paper, um, a lot of times, uh, for example, recycled paper is more expensive than non-recycled paper. Or if you need, a lot of clients need to use FSC type paper. Again, this is a special type of paper. Uh, the Forest Stewardship Council that uh, printers have to be certified in and it's, there's, it's just a more costly paper. So these types of things have to be specced and quoted in advance. Um, the production manager needs to think about postal logistics, and Alex is gonna get into a lot of that later on. I won't get into detail with that right now, but that will impact your costs. As well as, uh, is there just basic data processing needs, or is there gonna be considerable programming and trying to make estimates of what kind of work is gonna be involved with uh, getting a job set up for data processing? So that's kind of a list of things that the production manager needs to think about uh, when assessing gathering costs for a program. At the same time, we also want to be looking for cost saving ideas for our clients. So this is a good time to say, oh, our package is a little overweight. If we reduce the weight uh, slightly, we can save you some money. So maybe suggest some alternative lighter weight papers. Or is there gaining opportunities? Um, that's when you combine a component with other components of similar specifications on press and run them all at the same time. It saves some time in the setup costs for press. And then, um, you know, there's, there's a long list of cost saving ideas, but this is an opportunity for the production manager to kind of consider those things. And often our clients like to hear our ideas of what we can do to save some costs in their mailing. All right, so once we've budgeted out, we've, we've figured out which vendor we would like to work with, which suppliers, we need to make sure that they can meet our timelines. Can they deliver uh, the print that we need to the mail shop in time? Can the mail shop turn the job in the time frame needed? So um, 
there needs to be a, a stage in the process where the, the production manager is confirming schedules with, with suppliers that are going to be used for mailing. And uh, at the same time, also working with the client to set the dates that we're going to need deliverables sent to us. For example, when do we need the final art sent? When will we need the final data sent? Um, when will we need the postage check? So all of that needs to be worked out and shared with the client in advance. And also we need to get locked into manufacturing schedules. Some special things to consider with uh, scheduling is if you have uh, specialty items, sometimes they take a lot longer lead time. Premiums, uh, especially overseas premiums, are gonna take a long time, but uh, things like uh, catalogs or uh, labels can sometimes take a little longer lead time. Uh, so depending on what it is, it might take a little longer and you need to factor that in. If it's a particularly large volume campaign, you need to think about that. Somebody may not be able to just squeeze it into their schedule. You need to plan in it ahead so that people have you locked into their manufacturing schedules. Sometimes paper is not readily available. You have to order it from a mill and that takes time. Um, so if you have special paper, you need to think about that. And then also schedules are a lot of times uh, variable with the seasons. This time of the year, our mail shops and printers are a lot more flex flexible, but come fall, things get crazy. And uh, if you lose your spot in a schedule, there's no guarantees you're gonna get back in quite easily. You kind of go to the back of the line and, and, pr and pray for the best. But uh, so, uh, and, the, and then this year is an election year, which is making schedule crazy. So my advice is try to stick to your schedules when, you, uh, when we have them. This year is an election year and a census year. We got a double whammy yeah, on top of it. Double whammy. <laughs> got a lot of mail going out there. Yes, there is. Alrighty, next slide. All right, so that so once we got through those steps, the pre-production, the account manager, production manager is going to send an ATP to the client, outlining all the costs of the project. They're going to sign off and say, "This is what we're doing, full speed ahead." And this is when we actually get into production. So the first stage is printing. The main uh, goals of the printing stage, obviously, are to get all your items printing, printed, but to make sure they're 100% accurate. Because this is where you're really starting to invest real money and dollars into your project. So you don't want to go to press and it be incorrect. Because as you know, to do a reprint, it's going to be expensive. Um, at this stage, you also want to make sure that print quality is uh, meeting the expectations of the client. And uh, the production manager also needs to be um, making sure that all of your suppliers are working towards the, uh, the delivery dates that were agreed upon to get materials to your mail shop. With any direct mail campaign, uh, a production manager could be dealing with one printer if they're lucky, but it could be five, six, seven printers sometimes. So coordinating schedules among all these printers can be a juggling act. So um, printing gets started when the client releases the art to the production manager. And the first steps the production manager is gonna do is to look at that art against what was originally budgeted to make sure it still matches what we were anticipating. We're gonna reconcile any differences. If it's, uh, if it's got different colors or more colors, we might get some revised pricing or if there's more versions. So we'll, we'll address any of those, um, those concerns up front. They're gonna QC the art. We're, for every project we get in, we're gonna look at the art, we're gonna read through it, we're going to um, go through a series of QC checks kind of standard checks to of uh, um, making sure that our IMB barcodes are properly located, uh, that the address position is correct, things like that. And then we're going to go ahead and release the art to our chosen suppliers along with instructions. And then we're going to get into the proofing cycle. So the printer has received the art, they're going to create proofs. Now depending on what you're printing, you may need different types of proofs. Uh, so soft proofs are uh, digital proofs. It's a 
most likely a PDF file that gets emailed back and forth. These are good for simple copy, um, things like if you have a two color letter, um, you have type and a logo um, that's printing PMS. Uh, these are sufficient proofs to, to, to review to make sure that um, everything looks like it should. As far as color, when, when you're looking at digital proofs, depending on what computer monitor you're looking at it, you're gonna see different colors. So, you know, there's no standardized colors between cube computer monitors. So soft proofs are not good for judging color. Um, although most of the time, there's gonna be a PMS color being used. And printers know when they're running PMS colors to match the PMS color on the press to a PMS swatch book. So you can be pretty assured that your color is gonna be fine uh, with a, a PMS color um, for a soft proof. And then there's contract color proofs. These are used when you have more sophisticated art um, with photographic images or you have uh, just a lot of color and things happening in the art. And these are going to be a very close representation of what your color is actually gonna look like on press. It's not gonna be perfect um, because th there's no press that can match exactly the, the, the proof. Uh, there's always variations and, and color can be a little subjective when, when setting color on a press. But these are gonna be close and they're gonna show you the quality of the images and they're gonna show you the overall color. So you can, if somebody's face is too red, you can go back to the file and adjust the, the color. Um, and then there's mechanical proofs. These should be used if you've got uh, bindery functions or, or uh, bindery functions like folding, scoring, perfing, or booklets to make sure the pagination is correct. It's a physical dummy of how the piece is gonna be put together in the end. Um, so sophisticated folds, uh, pageant booklets, and uh, books are a good thing to have mechanical proofs for. And then finally, there's a press proof. And that's, uh, those are very rarely done. I have done them in my career. Um, and this is actually taking the, the, the component, putting it on the actual press that's gonna run it, running a few off, and then uh, proofing it that way. It's, uh, it's very expensive because you have to actually pay for another setup of the press. But if you have a very high-end piece, this may be the way to do it. <clears throat> and a lot of times you'll, you'll run something like that with like a museum quality type press, something, something that you're probably only going to run a few in the end off of, you know, maybe 10. You know, get actual posters for a museum of actual artwork, something like that. You want to make sure that it's matching exactly. Yes. So during the proofing stage, there's going to be the, the primary goals are to make sure it's 100% accurate before you're releasing or approving back to press. Because again, this is when it gets really expensive if there's mistakes. Uh, you want to make sure the color and image quality is satisfactory on the proofs. You want to make sure the finishing details are correct. Uh, we need to make sure that the printer has accurate specifications. Do they have the correct paper specified to run on the press? Are they gonna trim it to the correct size? How are they gonna fold it? Um, so those types of details need to be checked at this stage. And then finally, you need to make sure you've got your final quantities. And you need production managers will work closely with their clients to make sure that we understand uh, if the data counts um, are accurate enough that we can go to press All right, presses are rolling. Next slide. All right, so now we're on press. Um, not every item requires a press check, but there are some things that a production manager might consider for a press check. Uh, if it's a high-end piece, uh, more often than not, we, sh we should definitely be considering a press check. If this is uh, just a high-profile piece that uh, a lot of people, it's just incredibly important to the organization, like annual reports and uh, magazines, that, that type of thing. The calendars we do every year are a good example of something we press check. 
uh, the size of the run. As you know, printing is very expensive. So if, it, if it's a large run, you, you, we may want to consider making sure we have somebody press side seeing it as it's coming off the press to make sure it's to expectations. Anything that's color critical. Uh, some, some clients are, have something they're printing that they're just, they're very concerned about how it's going to look when it comes off the press. We should absolutely be there on press to guide the pressman in uh, making sure the color is set how it needs to be. And then also, there's always going to be color conflicts and compromises on press. As I said, uh, it's kind of a subjective art setting color on a printing press, and it's never going to be perfect as it is on the proof. Um, so sometimes compromises in, need to be made. Uh, so having somebody on press can help guide the pressman to make those decisions. And then also proofing is usually not done on the actual paper that is being printed and that will impact the look and the color. So being on press side again gives you an opportunity to see the piece on the actual paper and make adjustments however you see fit. All right, so that's it for press. Oh, cool. And now we're on to data personalization, and I'm going to be quiet, and Alex is going to take over. Thank you, Shannon. Great job. Um, so, after everything has been printed, now it's time to uh, actually do some real personalization. And the uh, first main step in personalization uh, is data. Data is incredibly important. Um, a lot of people say it's the, the most important part of, of any mailing because it's how you're actually speaking to the, the end recipient. In, in our case with nonprofits, it's the donor. So using a lot of personalization, speaking to them one-to-one -one, uh, really uh, elicits a, a feeling of a conversation. It elicits a, a personal feeling uh, in, in hopes of getting a donor or a potential donor really uh, in on your mission. So. Uh, data processing is very key. Uh, the first step, uh, we usually get uh, data in from a client and it comes along with uh, a file layout that tells us where each field is, where the name and address is on each file. Uh, we'll typically get a mail plan that dictates how that mail plan is going to be segmented up into different groups. Uh, we'll get a seed list. Sometimes it's in, in the mail file already. Other times uh, we need to add it in. Uh, at the mail shop, and uh, this seed list typically includes most of the uh, the client's names. Uh, we'll add our names in on occasion as well, and the idea is so that uh, both us and the client can get a sense of how the mailing is, how quickly it gets in home, uh, what it looks like when it gets there, uh, and it really kind of helps you feel like uh, you're getting the actual piece uh, that's being sent out to all of your, your constituencies. Um, the last thing that we'll get is data processing instructions. Uh, and these are key because this is, tells the, us as a production manager how, what to do with the data when it comes in, what fields to pull to, to create an address block, what fields to pull to, uh, to create a salutation. Do we want to say, uh, uh, dear last name, dear first name, last name? Uh, any of those types of instructions need to be given to us implicitly um, to make sure that we're processing the data and personalizing it and putting the packages together so that the strategy that was created months and months ago and the creative that was created months and months ago gets ex executed perfectly at this point. Now, uh, our production managers are very experienced, so if there's anything missing, uh, a lot of times at this point, we'll, we'll be able to catch anything that we really, we really need to figure out, uh, really need to ask questions up front. So you can see an example there of a mail plan that kind of specifies what goes into each package, what goes into each lot, because a lot of times you won't just have one package. Uh, that would be very rare is to have one control package that goes out to an entire mail file. Most often you have a control package, and this is a package that's been proven to, to get results, uh, either responses or actual revenue back to the client. But uh, Every client and every, every nonprofit that we work with, we're always testing against that control. We're always trying to beat the control. So we'll have multiple packages all at once so, so that we're constantly working to, to improve response, to improve our, our donor response uh, and, uh, and revenues in the end. So at this point, when we're just kind of getting everything in, uh, we want to make sure that uh, as a production manager that we're going through and everything's accounted for, uh, from a data processing perspective. 
a lot of it's done ahead, uh, but not all of it. Uh, there are certain things that we can only do at a mail shop, but uh, most mail shops that we work with can kind of do anything that needs to be done at this point. Um, so we want to make sure the data is processed accurately and efficiently. And most importantly, we want to make sure that it's prepped properly for the postal service because postage is your top cost line on any mailing budget. We typically get two types of files that we work in. One is a house file, and these are the names that uh, our clients know and have mailed to before. They are the people that they've formed a relationship with, that they've probably got a donation from in the past. Uh, and then we have an acquisition file uh, that's a completely separate type of mailing. And these are people that our clients are trying to bring into their house files. So people that they may have never talked to in the past or may have talked to very long ago um, that we're trying to get some sort of uh, response out of. And those files aren't housed with our client. Those are typically uh, housed at a third party data provider. And then our client works together with them to create uh, the acquisition files that we eventually get. Uh, we typically have to do some sort of formatting uh, when the files come in. Uh, acquisition files in particular often come in as all uppercase. So uh, we'll typically need to do some sort of upper lowercase. Sometimes we need to add punctuation or do some sort of address modification to fit in a window or if we have too many fields, something like that. And then we can take the data and go through uh, the first of two uh, cleansing processes, cleansing software offered by the Postal Service. Uh, the first is uh, the Coding Accuracy Support System, or CAS. And this is actually just a certification that our mail shop and their uh, software, internal data processing software, is certified against the Postal Service to accurately and efficiently update addresses to match what the Postal Service has as their address. So it typically does minor little tweaks like changing 123 Main Street to 123 Main Drive, depending on the name and address. Um, and it certifies that the, the programming that's done at the mail shop is up to uh, the USPS standard uh, for address processing. Uh, after that, the second software that's uh, created uh, by the, the Postal Service is called NCOA, or National Change of Address. Um, people are moving constantly in this country. One in five people are, are moving on an annual basis every year. Um, and it makes a, a lot of change in addresses. So most people, not everybody, will go to the Postal Service and actually change their address and give it to give their new address, uh, say they were at uh, um, 123 Main Street and now they're at five, 456 Main Street. So that pairs their name and their family's name with that new address. And bumping our files up against NCOA makes sure that we have the most accurate data and most up-to-date data. In fact, for to get a pre-sort discount, with your mail file, you need to verify that you've run your file up against NCOA every 95 days. And this fall, uh, qualifies for what uh, the USPS calls their move update uh, qualification and allows for postal discounts. Uh, Pre-sorting at this point is done to take an overall mail file and segment everything based on their geographic location, typically by zip code. Um, and this allows the production manager at this point to create a postage request. So once everything's been pre-sorted and every, uh, the logistics have been figured out about how to most efficiently get mail to where it's going, we can create uh, all the discounts that we might get from the Postal Service and create a postage request that'll go out to the client. Um, it's very important to get this out as quickly as possible because there's, again, there's a lot of money being dealt with here. So we wanna make sure that we're giving our client adequate preparation time to get that money on hand and get it back to us so that we have time to, to use it to actually process the mailing with. Um, part of the pre-sort is by going through automation. And this is just adding a barcode to all of our pieces uh, that we can get uh, some sort of postal discount on. Uh, the IMB has been used for years now and it creates a lot of, it has a lot of information in it that allows the Postal Service to quickly and accurately just scan each mail piece and send it to where it needs to go geographically. So postal logistics is a part of this. Uh, this is uh, 
worked uh, a partnership with our mail shop to figure out how best to get the mail where it needs to go. Um, your standard mail, your most basic way that you're going to mail something is through local entry. And this is just taking the mail directly from the mail shop and dropping it at whatever post office is closest. And that post, is, post office is responsible to getting it to the closest SCF, from there to the closest NDC. And from there, it goes to whatever destination NDC is closest to where it's going to wind up going. Then it goes to the smaller uh, SCF, finally to the local post office, and absolutely finally to the end residence. And this is why, number one, it costs a lot to send mail local entry, and it takes a long time, 12 to 16 days. Um, and this is because we're not doing anything for the post office. The, the idea, uh, uh, the kind of agreement that we have with uh, the USPS is what they call work share. So any work that we're able to do for them uh, enables us to get a lower postage rate and enables us to get our, our mail there quicker. So a big part of that is something like drop shipping, NDC or SCF drop shipping, where we take the mail and skip those first couple steps and send trucks of mail out to the destination NDCs around the country um, in order to get a lower postage rate for us. Now, you have to do a cost benefit analysis on that, right? Because you have to pay for the truck now. So is the discount that you're getting on, that po on the mailing enough to pay for that truck to get where it needs to go? And similarly to an SCF. Uh, now, there are some ways to get around that. Uh, uh, the main way that we use is by commingling. So this allows us to work with a third party organization called the commingler um, that we can send our mail to and they actually do all the sortation there and they create their own trucks based not just with our mail, but with all of their clients mail. So say we only have one piece that's going to Anchorage, Alaska in our mailing. Well, we're not going to pay for a whole truck to send one piece across the country to get to Anchorage, Alaska, but a commingler is able to combine that one piece with thousands of other pieces and create full pallets of mail that eventually create full trucks of mail that are all going to Anchorage, Alaska. And they'll take a little piece of the postal discount that we'll get, and we'll get a post, postal discount on that as well by sending it to them and letting them handle all that dropship organization. So the production manager at this point is reviewing all of these types of options in order to create the most efficient way to get the mail there. Now, it depends on the client in a lot of cases. Sometimes it's most important to get it there quickly. Sometimes it's most importantly to get there cheaply. So um, a lot of times we need to work with our clients to figure out what their end goal is uh, to get uh, the mail to where it eventually needs to go. So after all the, the postal analysis is figured out, we'll take the mail and we'll segment it into different parts of, uh, of different packages where it needs to go. Again, like I was talking about, you know, a large part of the mail is going to get, of the mailing is going to get a control package, but we're also going to have test packages out there as well. We might use this point to actually suppress records out of the mailing if it's not already been done for us. You know, say we're, we're only giving a mailing to Virginia. Well, we want to suppress out any zip codes that aren't in Virginia. Or say we're only giving it to our highest dollar donors in the past. Well, we want to suppress out anybody that's given under $100 in the past or somebody who hasn't given in a long time we want to suppress them out um, after all that's been taken care of we'll append a source code or a mail code or a key code depending on how which way you want to uh, fragment it onto each record and that makes it easy for us to track back uh, which segment each donor or potential donor got into you know say it's something as easy as ABC one two three but it allow that code that's printed on each piece when we get a donation back allows us to tell, oh, this came from this mailing in April of 2019 or whatever it was. Um, and we were asking for $25 and they gave us $50 or whatever. Um, but it's broken down on a lot of information, not just about the mailing itself, but about the donor as well. Uh, paired with that source code is an ID number or finder number, and this allows us to track that specific name. Um, so you know, John Smith gets ID number 12345, and that number will travel with them through when, whenever we mail John Smith, that ID number is going to go with them so we can track back to them. If it's an acquisition 
name and it's somebody that we don't know or a client doesn't know, they'll get a finder number. And this will be a randomly generated number, but paired with the source code, we know that it was this name from that mailing from this acquisition file that we got from the third party vendor. From there, we need to build more information sometimes. Uh, if the mail file is incomplete and it doesn't have all of the personalization information that we need, sometimes we have to build a, a gift array that's printed on the piece. So we're actually asking for something. You know, our, our nonprofit clients are always asking for an amount. So there's a strategy behind how we ask for it. Uh, a lot of times it's built off of the highest previous contribution or the most recent contribution and multiplied from there to create an ask string. Uh, we always need to build a, uh, an address block on every piece, but we need DP instructions from the client to tell us how to build that. You know, what fields do we pull to create that address block? Same thing with a salutation. How do we build a salutation when we're writing a letter directly to them? Remember, it's all about making it as personal as possible. So, you know, you don't want to just say dear friend on everything if you can avoid it. You know, you want to actually say dear first name. Well, what if the first name's blank? What do you do then? Dear last name, dear Mr. Last name, dear Mrs. Last name. Um, all the way down, whatever options we have based on what's in the data um, to create a, a personalized feel to that, to that letter. And the production manager will go through those instructions, send them to the mail shop, and get reports back of examples before we even personalize anything on actual printed stock, just to show that the instructions that we're giving to the mail shop are being interpreted and uh, processed correctly. Finally, after all the data has been processed, then we can actually put ink to paper and start personalizing everything. So these examples here uh, are what we call FPO or for position only. The magenta copy on there is typically used for actual personalized uh, copy at a letter shop, whereas the black copy would already be pre-printed. Those are pre-printed pieces that came to the letter shop um, already printed on there. And then we add the, the magenta copy that'll come off as black when it's actually personalized uh, at the letter shop. But that just shows variable ver versus generic copy. So once we've given all these instructions to the mail shop, then we'll get PDF proofs back of these live setups um, so that we can check name by name, you know, we'll get a handful of names from every package just to make sure that everything's being processed and uh, personalized correctly. Something that we always need to think of uh, in the mail shop world is names versus sheets and forms. Uh, in most instances, we won't just print one name on a form. We'll try to print as many up as possible. Uh, and this achieves uh, two things, mainly that it runs faster, the more names that we can get up on it. And because it runs faster, it will also run cheaper. So the smaller the, the, the personalized piece, the more names you can get up on it and the faster it will run. But it's just a balance that you need to figure out whether you want to write a full four page letter to a potential donor or if you want to give them uh, a little buck slip with just a, a, a dear last name on and ask them for, for a donation. Apart from laser personalization, we also have inkjet personalization. This is most often used on the outer envelope or the carrier but we can inkjet anything that we want. Um, on the carrier, it's typically just an address block and depending on the size of the address block, you might need one or two inkjet heads on it. Uh, your typical head is about two inches tall. Uh, but also if you wanna uh, inkjet something else on the carrier, so you wanna put a, a reply address on there that's personalized, or you wanna put, um, you wanna move the IMB down away from the address block. Those are all things that we need to add in an additional head. And the production manager at this point will also get PDF proofs of all of the inkjet uh, that will be done, a handful of names per uh, package just to double check that everything's being inkjetted properly. After all the personalization is done, then we go into bindery at the letter shop. Um, and a lot of these folding and bowing and trimming is done in the generic printed world as well. Um, Boeing and trimming those specifically to 
uh, the letter shop and that it takes off the pin feeds off of a form and folds that final letter or reply down to its final name size. Um, drop cutting and nesting is also a, a function that's done typically here. Uh, most often, if there's a letter reply printed as one piece, we'll drop cut out a uh, section of that form and nest the reply into the letter. And this enables us to have one printed and personalized piece that gets folded down and comes out as two personalized pieces. So it reduces a point of match there and saves some money. After that's all been done, we'll go to inserting and the production manager will actually get a insertion proof. Again, typically a, a PDF proof of actual printed personalized pieces fanned out and put into the carrier shown like that, uh, that we can double check and make sure that the correct uh, pieces are getting inserted into each package that way. Uh, we'll check uh, flat samples of each, folded samples, inserted samples, and double check all the inventory codes uh, because a lot of times there are printed pieces uh, between packages are almost identical except for uh, a small code. Some other functions at a letter shop that might be necessary, uh, tabbing and wafer sealing typically used to close uh, self-mailers to qualify for postal regulations. Um, inserting is done to almost every package that has an envelope. Uh, machine inserting versus hand inserting, obviously hand inserting significantly more expensive, but sometimes it's necessary. Um, if you're mailing a, a high dollar donor package, uh, sometimes you want to paper clip a, a stamp to it or paper clip a business card. Uh, and those are all hand functions, but uh, in most or in a lot of cases, you'll try to get away with machine inserting if you can, because it is just that much uh, cheaper. A lot of times we'll affix postage in line if it's already up, not already on there. Uh, after everything's been inserted, a stamp or a meter will just be uh, dropped right onto that carrier right then and there. So then we are all approved to mail at that point. But our job isn't done. Post mailing, uh, we have a lot to do to, to wrap up uh, a job to get it ready for billing. Uh, we we'll also review an, uh, an inventory report, especially if we're planning on using some of the generic components on future mailings to make sure that we have enough. Uh, and we don't need to reorder anything. Uh, we'll always get packaged samples from a letter shop. Those are actually inserted blank samples that we can double check and make sure everything's been personalized correctly, everything's been inserted correctly, and so that we have a record of those actual samples. Uh, clients always like to have those as well. Then we can finally get ready to actually send out an invoice. The most important part of uh, post mailing is mail tracking. Uh, gone are the days when we would be able to just send a postal certification to a client and say our job's done. We track everything that we send out. Um, seeds definitely, sometimes mail monitor, which are just third party seeds. Uh, the idea is that where seeds are, our seeds are typically geographically uh, concentrated client seeds are typically geographically concentrated mail monitor are third-party seeds spread out across the country um, and gray hair is the partner that we use for most of our mail tracking uh, the intelligent mail barcode uh, allows scans of every mail piece that we send out uh, to be monitored through the uh, usps's informed delivery or informed visibility program um, and allows gray hair to track um, almost all of its mail uh, that goes out. Now, there are certain human error, things like that, uh, machinery error that, that doesn't get scanned for, but a vast majority of the mail that we send out gets scanned and allows us to track it um, to make sure that everything's arriving as, as planned. So, uh, just a couple uh, quick uh, common oversights that we see uh, during the production process. Uh, delays both in artwork or data always cause issues. We do what we can, uh, as always, and our partners do what we can. Uh, using four color to build one color images. Uh, Shannon talked a little bit about this, but um, PMS colors, especially in a logo, should almost never be built out of four color if you can avoid it because it won't come out looking exactly alike. Uh, printing cut sheet. Uh, when you should be printing continuous, if it, especially if it's a large quantity, you want to run it on a web or a continuous form if you can. Um, undersizing something that has bleeds 
If we're bleeding an image off of a printed piece, we need to make sure that we undersize it so that it can actually be trimmed down so that it'll actually bleed off the end after it's been printed. Um, designing a package with non-standard envelope, there's thousands of standard envelopes out there. There's no reason that we need to create our own envelope size. Uh, we can get a standard envelope for almost anything. Um, altering the size of one component without uh, deciding how it will affect the other side, uh, other components in there. A lot of times you have a control package and decide, oh, you know what, let's, uh, let's add an insert to this package that we saw work well elsewhere. Well, did that insert that worked well elsewhere also fit in the same size envelope? Something like that. Um, proving a four color image on a computer. Shannon talked about this as well. Um, RGB is not the same as CMYK. So it's never gonna look exactly the same. If you have a photorealistic image, you need to get a contract color proof to make sure that it's printing or it's going to be printing the way you want it to. Um, using the proofing process and especially the uh, laser personalization process as a last round of AAs, that's a big no-no. Um, everything's been printed at that point. So there's uh, minimal things that we can do once we get into a mail shop to actually correct things. Um, data and artwork that, that isn't checked prior to releasing it to us, um, especially in the data world, do we have everything that we need uh, to actually personalize it? You know, if, if there's a field that you want personalized on a letter, do we, do we have the, the, the data that we need to actually get it done? Um, and lastly, uh, having artwork not designed for mass, maximum address lines, we don't see this that often, but making sure there's a, a window that's big enough to handle everything. Just a couple examples as well. Um, having a window that's too big, making sure that you're using the tap test to have that address block fall into uh, the window, and more importantly, the IMB fall into the window. But do you have too much falling into the window? Is the window too big? Uh, and you might have something uh, with what we call window contamination. Just another couple uh, things that we need to check out for. So I think that's about it. Um, I don't see any questions there, but we'll be on for a few more minutes. I realize we went a couple minutes over, but if you have any questions, we're here to answer them. Um, in addition, uh, I would like to send out another poll. Um, this is one of the few times that we've done this one. So if you have any suggestions for um, improvement or things that, uh, that you feel like we should have talked more about, um, please let us know. Um, go ahead and get into that poll there and, and let us know if there's any um, <laughs> anything else that we need to improve here. Um, but apart from that, thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to come to our webinar here and uh, we hope you got something out of it. Yeah, we hope you did. And please don't be shy asking questions if you've got some. Absolutely. If not, you can always reach out to us uh, at Production Solutions, uh, and uh, we'd be happy to answer, answer any questions uh, directly. So we'll give the poll another 10 seconds or so, and uh, then we'll be closing it out. All righty. Well, thanks very much, everybody. Hope you have a great rest of your day. You have a visitor behind you, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yep, uh, that was bound to happen. <laughs> School's been canceled. <laughs> Are you going to say hi? <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Talk to you later. Bye.